Welcome, welcome everyone. I want to first give a thanks to everyone showing up again um, in week three of the seminar. Uh, we're definitely um, having a great time with you all and um, definitely um, <clears throat> as well as uh, fulfilling the answers to the questions you all may have in these times. So uh, we're very honored to be here during this stream. So um, as we begin to fill up the stream, um, I first want to uh, welcome myself. Uh, I am Marlo Brooks, um, one of your co-hosts for today. We also have Cameron Pinyot. If you could speak, Cam, share everyone. What's going on, everybody? Um, shoot. So a little bit that's going on. Um, a lot of different things in the community. Oh, well, it's true just to say that I appreciate everybody that's uh, coming in today uh, for this conversation. Um, Appreciate all of the panelists. I appreciate uh, everybody that's, you know, continuing the conversations that are, uh, uh, shoot, uh, they pretty much need to be immediate right now at a, at the height. That's what's going on today. Uh, but, yeah, I just want to get that little spiel. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. And we also have our new co-host joining us, Yvette Reles powell if you could speak to the, our community today. Hi, I'm Yvette Relius Powell. Um, it's amazing that we're doing this. I wanted to say I watched the um, series last week and I really enjoyed the conversations. Everybody went off. Actually, Cameron, you really snapped. I really felt what you were saying. And um, yeah, just thank you to everybody who's out here being an ally and everybody who wants to be a part of this conversation and wants to pursue action after these conversations. Thank you. That's great, that's great. And again, myself, I'm Marlo Brooks, and if I could just say how I'm doing in these times, um, I'm doing pretty well, I'm holding on, I'm holding on, um, as these videos of different injustices still ring in, even after what we experienced with um, brother George Floyd, as more and more things are seeming to come to light, um, it's really just teaching me to hold my family near and dear. Um, and the ones closest to me, uh, just to protect each other, just be more aware um, of our surroundings and things that's going on out there in the world. Um, <clears throat> these, are these are trying times. And, um, you know, as we as a community, we can weather any storm. So we will weather this one as well. So as we get into series number three on conversations on race and policing, hosted by a student panelist, um, also with campus guests and faculty and community figures. Um, today we are going to start today's broadcast off with um, a land acknowledgement, something we, we do here at CSUSB, where we recognize the land that we sit, where we sit on and we honor it. And um, so in doing so, I, wanna, I want to go and read our land acknowledgements to start today's series. So. We recognize that at California State University of San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the California State University of San Bernardino's community has been benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationships to native people. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University of San Bernardino's more, San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous people. So we thank you. Now, <clears throat> as we start today's event, we are, I'm gonna turn things over to Professor Alam Mustaba, Musab, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I butchered that once again. Uh, uh, Dr. Mutasa, um, as she introduced um, another panelist today. Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, actually. How are you doing? Thank you, thank you for our students. Thank you for Professor Texiera and Professor. Yure and all uh, the amazing panelists for joining us today. It's a great privilege and honor for me to introduce Professor Dr. Robin Kelly from 
UCLA, um, and I had actually the uh, honor of introducing him before at CSUSB. It was when the Center for Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies um, at CSUSB uh, actually uh, organized a panel called From Ferguson to Palestine in 2015. Uh, and I also had the, the honor of being uh, with Dr. Kelly on a delegate, um, US delegate that went last year, traveled to South Africa uh, to take part in the Teaching Palestine Conference and the tour about the um, solidarity between Palestinians and South Africans. And he's very humble, so I'm, he asked me to read a very short, short bio, but he's an amazing scholar and you can read more about him at the webpage of uh, UCLA. So Dr. Robin D.G. DG Kelly is uh, the Gary Nash Endowed Chair in U.S. History at UCLA. His books include Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Immigration, Umama's Dysfunctional Fighting, The Culture Wars in Urban America, Hammer and Ho, Alabama, Communists During the Great Depression, and uh, Thelonious Monk, The Life and Times of an American Original. His essays and opinion pieces have appeared in The Nation, Monthly Review, New York Times, Counterpunch, uh, Boston Review, Journal of Palestine Studies, as well as anthologies such as Policing the Planet, Why the Policing Crisis Lead to Black Lives Matter, edited by Jordan Camp and Christina uh, Hetherton, and police, and police Brutality, edited by Jill Nelson. Please, everyone, welcome Dr. Robin Kelly. You need to unmute. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Um, thank you so much, Akram. I really appreciate that um, introduction. Um, and I, by the way, it's just a free plug. The book Policing the Planet you can get for free as an ebook if you go to Verso Books. Uh, and in fact, go to Verso Books and get a lot of free books um, as ebooks right now about policing, state violence, and um, resistance. So, what I want to talk to everyone about um, as briefly as possible is a really big topic, and that is the role of the police in, um, in perpetuating racial capitalism. Uh, and some of you may have seen the op-ed piece by Miriam Kaba uh, in the New York Times. If you haven't, you need to go out and read it. It's called, Yes, We Mean Literally Abolish the Police. And that's the name of it. Um, because there's a lot of confusing talk about defunding the police versus abolishing the police. And I'm gonna try to address some of that uh, in this talk, but what I really want to focus on are some of the themes that she touches on, um, and that is the fact that the police are uh, here mainly, the main function is the protection of property, the protection of capital, the protections of, of owners of capital, and the protection of white people. And this goes back um, to the idea that the precursors of the modern police force uh, are the slave patrols. And this is something that we talk about all the time, we hear it all the time, um, that the first police for the state patrols. But I just wanna make a slight adjustment with this idea because um, the slave patrols were not formed by the state. You know, the police, they were not a professional police force. In fact, what's interesting about the slave patrols was that they were citizen militias. The entire armed populace in the South were slave patrols. Um, and their, their, their actions were, san were sanctioned by the state but they were not a state body. I mean, um, the rise of professional police come, come, comes a little later, but their job as slave patrols was to put down slave insurrections and capture runaways. Uh, so, you know, fugitive um, uh, human beings. So I say this because the modern police force was created as a coercive arm of the state to replace, and in fact, repress uh, what, was called the self-acting self -acting armed people. That is, you, you talk about societies without police, but a lot of people with guns. And so the idea in most societies was that they want to disarm working people and the masses and have the state have all the course of power. But the difference is the US is a settler colonial state. It's a settler colonial slave society, which they could keep the armed white populace <laughs> armed without necessarily forming a professional force to deal with them, at least not right away. And why is this? Because slave patrols were made up of armed people because they were white and because their very freedom 
from indentured servitude and other forms of bondage required that they participate in upholding slavery in controlling and killing and dispossessing indigenous people. So there were no threat to state power, at least not in the South. So the point is, and this is a very important, I think, recognition, is that an armed white population was central to the legitimization of anti-Black violence and anti-Indigenous violence, of dispossession and enslavement. But it also did this other things that shored up all these white poor, propertyless, working class people in support of a regime that they didn't get m much from except for some crumbs, but it was a regime that was built on white supremacy. So when industrial capitalism starts to take off, these very people start to become dangerous because now they may hate indigenous people and black people and brown people, but they're trying to get better wages. They're trying to figure out how to improve their situation and they start to challenge state power and challenge corporate power. And then soon by the late 19th century, you have a police force whose job it is, is to manage worker rebellion and to protect property. And this is still the case in the 20th century, but in the 20th century, property, especially the early 20th century, meant white owned property. And police have been instrumental in the destruction and theft of black property, black owned property, as well as black lives. So the history of race riots in this country, for example, we think of, you know, like, Detroit in 67, or we think of Watson 65, or the LA Rebellion. But the real history of race riots in America are white mobs attacking black communities. That is it. The, the most famous example we have is one we're talking about this week because it's the 99th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre of 1921. Um, and of course, um, someone's president is going over there <laughs> to Tulsa. Uh, but think about Tulsa. I mean, Tulsa is interesting because you have two days of white massacre, two days of white violence. Kill, at least 300 Black people were killed, hundreds injured, more than almost 2,000 Black-owned homes, um, uh, businesses, uh, schools, churches, a hospital, a public library, destroyed, raised, covering 35 city blocks. And by the way, we have to stop saying Black Wall Street because when you when we say Black Wall Street for the Greenwood area, we make it seem as though it's one street and only businesses. We're talking about 35 square blocks, the entire Greenwood community raised flat as if it was bombed, destroyed. But mass looting took place. And by looting, we're talking about white people breaking into Black homes and businesses, stealing guns and ammunition, burning buildings, shooting people, taking their things and killing them in cold blood. But the part we don't talk about which I think is worth thinking about in terms of the carceral state, is that the governor of Oklahoma declared martial law, deployed the National Guard, which then began rounding up Black people to be imprisoned. And it took them to camps, these internment camps. And many of them were, were kept in camps through the winter of 1921-22. So for six months, eight months, almost as long as a year, right? At least through the summer. Um, so think about what that means. 7,000 Black people in turn, after their homes are destroyed, left them homeless. But they're the ones being in prison. Um, but police attacks on Black and Brown property and Black assets isn't just a thing of the past. We've seen how police under neoliberalism, for example, uh, have been used to attack Black and Brown entrepreneurship. Consider, for example, how in the 1980s and 90s, um, the police, like in New York City, for example, in LA, targeted black and brown street vendors, you know, under broken windows policing. Under Giuliani, they were pushed off streets of, streets of Harlem and elsewhere. And then, of course, some of the most high profile killing involved, police killings involve who? Street vendors, Eric Garner selling cigarettes illegally, Alton Sterling selling CDs. And they were approached on the pretext that they needed to be prosecuted for selling things illegally, right? So now, depending on where you live and what you look like, there isn't much of a difference between, say, the police, National Guard, and military. And I know a lot of, some of you like watch MSNBC and you watch all this hand-wringing about like the posse comitatus and the violation of the constitution. Why is it that Trump wants to use the military, domestic disputes and all this other business, um, when in fact, 
the military has been deployed in domestic disputes from the beginning of this country. What is the war on, on indigenous people if not a domestic dispute, especially when the state decided that these are not sovereign nations anymore, but so-called domestic dependencies, you know, in, as a way to get around honoring treaties. Police serve and still serve as the army against social movements, not to maintain law and order, but against social movements. Think about it. It's the, the police that are the front lines when there are strikes, labor unions, when socialists and anarchists and communists are organizing, when feminists and LGBTQ, LGBTQ movements are demanding the rights. In fact, this is the 50th anniversary of the Pride Parade, which of course was replaced by All Black Lives Matter. Um, but the original Pride Parade was also a challenge to the police because the police, the policing of the LGBTQ communities in LA became a point of con contention. And many of those people were black and brown, by the way. Um, the police are the front line against anti-racist movements, as we see. The police are the front lines against national liberation movements, as we see over and over again. And the structure of the police was molded in an imperial context. That is to say, both in the continental US, but also abroad. We could talk about, and you know, look this up, the US occupation of the Philippines the US occupation of Puerto Rico, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, these are all places that became laboratories of policing operations. And of course, we could talk about what's going on right now and has been going on for years. That is the ongoing exchanges and joint trainings between Israel and US police departments. And these exchanges have been going on for a while, facilitated by groups like the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs uh, and the Anti-Defamation League, which of course is touted for its anti-bias training. And groups like uh, Jewish Voice for Peace and others have launched a deadly exchange campaign to expose and really challenge this ongoing relationship between Israeli military and police training in the US because they're using the same counterterrorism tactics, the same racial profiling, the same hyper-policing, the same kind of militarization that was practiced on Palestinian people. Um, and finally, two things I want to get to is that is, uh, let's think about police as generators of revenue, okay? <laughs> so police have been reorganized over the last 20, 25 years to become generators of revenue. Police have generated revenue through asset forfeiture, that is seizing cash and property from a suspect even before there's a conviction, which in the strictest terms, I mean, if you really are a capitalist, you'd be like, that's terrible, that violates the right of private property, but you know, that's another story. And then there's the accumulation of fees and fines that also generate revenues for municipalities that also help pay for and justify the police. So the f most famous examples, of course, Ferguson, St. Louis. In 2013, Ferguson's municipal court issued nearly 33,000 arrest warrants to a population of just over 21,000 people. That is a, an arrest warrant and a half for everybody. Um, generating about $2.6 million in income for the municipality. In St. Louis, the same year, St. Louis County and City Municipal Courts acquired uh, more than $61 million in fines and fees in 2013. Where did the money come from? Mostly municipalities where on average, 62% of the residents were black and 22% lived below the poverty line. Meanwhile, the cost, of, the cost of policing or the cost of police in cities are not only bloated because of the budgets, but they're ballooning because of these settlements, um, to, these settlements that the cities have to engage in to deal with police misconduct cases. So Chicago, for example, shelled out $100 million to settle police misconduct suits in 2018 alone. Between 20, 2005, 2018, uh, Los Angeles uh, shelled out something like $880 million, almost a billion dollars in settlements for these police misconduct cases and wrongful death cases. Death cases. So how do they pay for these things? Well, this is where when we gotta be real careful when we talk about defunding the police, we gotta know where the money comes from. Uh, so how do they pay? Well, a lot of cities and counties don't have the money to pay these huge um, settlements. The, the individual settlements are not large, it's just that there's so many of them. <laughs> um, and that means, what do they do? They issue bonds to pay the costs. 
um, and banks and other firms uh, collect fees for their services and investors earn interest, which is to say cities borrow the money and banks manage the process. They loan the money and manage, and manage the process, or rather they manage the process. So using bonds to cover, cover settlements increases the cost of the original settlement. So if you, are, if you have a payout of $100 million, it may cost another $100 million to actually manage the settlement itself because it's all outsourced. And who benefits? Wall Street. Wells Fargo makes money off the police brutality bonds. Goldman Sachs makes money. Bank of America makes money. Regional banks make money off, off of this. And where's the money come from? Well, it's through the bond measures and through people's pockets by basically fleecing poor black and brown people in their own communities who are being over police. So I think you know, the, the, the continued willingness, and this is the last thing I wanna say, uh, on, you know, the last two things is the continued willingness on the part of cities to cover these settlements, right, um, is important. We we always we tend to say, you know, the problem is that police unions are so powerful, and because they have qualified immunity, that's why cities are forced to make these payments. And I actually think we have to be really, really careful because it is in the interest of capital to, to basically make sure that the police are an instrument of terror, an instrument of terror. That's what the police have been. The police convey terror and they convey the power of an absolute state, right? And so in some ways it's worth the price to some interests. Just, so we can't just say that police unions are so powerful. Of course they're powerful. How did they become powerful? And why did they take on the ideology they took on? A lot of it has to do with what their function has been in a society. It wasn't like the police were really nice and friendly and then suddenly something happened under Richard Nixon to make them mean. It's not that simple. So I got, we got to pay attention. So finally, I don't have a grand conclusion, but I do hope that we think about these things uh, when we call for defunding the police, because defunding the police is not just a budgetary adjustment. It is ultimately about the abolition of the police as we know it, and the creation of new forms of public safety uh, that would provide real safety. And I don't mean just physical safety or safety from alleged crimes, but I mean safety and, and security in our livelihoods. And that means the dismantling of racial capitalism as a whole and the, the beginnings of an economy and society uh, and healthcare system that actually focus on caring for individuals and ending massive uh, economic inequality uh, in, in, in social violence, state violence. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> I just want to say uh, the fact that you ended it off with that's all I have to say after you just preached the whole sermon. <laughs> but um, everything you just said was, you know, you just pretty much preached, um, preached a word that everybody needs to hear. I wish there were more people in this conversation to hear that. Uh, everything that you discussed is pretty much like it's all within the media right now. And it's also being blocked out. So many people are using, I, I don't even want to, I don't even know if it's privilege. I, I think it's just systemic at this point because they don't even see that it's the privilege right now. So people are even blocking out to the point that, that all these different things are happening. Like how you said, um, like our social movements, like our social movements are going against the law right now. So it's like the fact that, you know, these are law enforcers, what, what they're doing is, you know, within their jurisdiction they have the right to be doing everything that they're doing so it's like there is no way we win this battle by fighting our own law the the thing that we need to do is we need to eradicate all the power that is self-proclaimed leadership because it isn't even leadership as we see like uh the real leaders are the ones that are out there um trying to actually bring the unity within the people and um trying to make it to where it's a more uh a life where there's more equality and actual equality because our constitution says it, but it doesn't mean it. You know, everything else within it, uh, it's, it's all said, but nothing is meant right now. Um, also another, another thing that I want to point out when you uh, brought up the funds, like 
they're making money off of off of killing us and all and, and um it, it, it it's really something to pay attention to at this time being that generations after generations have fought this and we're all still fighting the same thing and you know the fact that it's for capital the fact that it's for money right now and it's for all this all these funds they've gone to the extent of you know following just exactly what the Willie Lynch letter you know implied and how exactly do you disband all of that and I you know I don't I don't know because it's like every time we bring up a new social movement every time we discuss things somehow some somehow it always ceases um right but go ahead well is it is, so is this a question like how do we do how do we actually do that um, well it, it's i know that's a question that no i mean we've been searching for the answer for, for yeah, a minute, well, so I, I i'll be really brief i know i know Aklam needs to speak um no, it's okay and i also uh someone asked if you could mention what is happening at ucla because that's also related oh okay it is what's happening so let me let me answer the question and then also say a little bit what's, what's going on at UCLA. So, I mean, the good news is that this generation that's in the streets right now, and when I say generation, it's really um, the kind of abolitionist politics, the abolitionist vision that we're witnessing uh, has its origins really in the 1990s, um, in opposition to Clinton, actually, in the crime bill, in, in opposition to, to um, neoliberalism itself. Well, what's interesting is that this generation has, for, for me at least, the most visionary understanding of abolition, one that entails everything. That is, in other words, after we, 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 we've been in situations like this, but it's not the same. This is so different. After ni the rebellions of the 1960s, um, people were calling for more black police. They were calling for better trained police. And of course, liberals still say stuff like that. No one believes that, that everyone knows it doesn't work. They were looking for, you know, um, community advisory boards to oversee the police. Uh, they were looking for um, more community engagement and they were doing things like, you know, police athletic league and things like that. None of it actually got to the core point is that the police make us dangerous. The police create dangerous situations for us. The police are not there to protect and serve and never have been. You know, they're there to subjugate certain communities and protect others, right? So now people know that. So when they say defund, abolish, they're saying we want something revolutionary. And, and they're also recognizing that the violence of the police is not simply gendered as violence against black men. It never has been just that nor has it been gendered in terms of cisgender people. It has been violence against queer people, violence against women, violence against kids, irrespective of age, violence, the social violence that they reproduce. Um, and so in some respects, this is the visionary project. And also recognition, the most amazing thing to me, recognition that prisons, caging people, doesn't solve the problem, you know? Um, and the, the genuine abolitionists are not even call, saying that we need jail time for cops. We need to get rid of jails altogether and figure out another way, restorative anti-carceral means of trying to, to bring justice and, and, and accountability because all that stuff doesn't work. It's time for something new. And I see a generation that's laying that out on the streets. Um, very quickly, in terms of UCLA, so I'm part of a, a group called Divest Invest, UCLA Faculty Collective which came about um, around a lot of different things. Specifically, uh, after the first wave of protests, um, the, the LAPD used Jackie Robinson Stadium as a field for detaining protesters. You know, not, didn't ask the faculty. I mean, the chancellor was like, yeah, go ahead, use it. And so we raised questions about this and demanded that they hold, UCLA hold a public hearing under detentions, establish a compensation fund, uh, for any protesters who were detained at Jackie Robinson Stadium, drop all disciplinary actions against students who participated in the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations or the UC for COVID protests, it's cost of living in, uh, increase. Um, and also, we're also calling for UCLA to end its relationship with the LAPD, with all county, state, and federal police departments and security agencies to defund 
UCPD, the UC um, Police Department, which by the way, the starting salary for UCPD um, is slightly higher than the starting salary for assistant professors. Keep, keep that in mind. <laughs> and oh, we place oh, well. UCPD with um, an anti with anti carceral forms of accountability, including restorative uh, and transformative justice, uh, community created uh, forms of, of public safety, and then also to redirect the resources that we spend on UCPD and spend on policing students to Black studies, to ethnic studies, to Chicano studies, you know, uh, to you know, racial and gender justice teaching on campus, to community initiatives that support Black faculty, staff, students, and workers on campus, most of whom are Black and Brown. And so we're trying to really reorganize the university in a way. And of course, the administration is kind of hemming and hawing, but you know, putting out a front saying, yes, we're in conversation when they're not really in conversation. So this is the battle that we're engaged in right now at UCLA. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, just to pretty much piggyback on everything that you were saying, um, I really do believe that this is the generation to do it. I mean, we have many, di many different generations fighting the same thing and you know, there's so many intersections, well, intersectionalities within this fight, and that's what we need to, you know, uh, cater our focus to, all those different inter uh, intersectionalities that are within this fight. We're all oppressed to white supremacy, police brutality, uh, racial injustices and discrimination, and that's what, like, our focus needs to be on. Our focus needs to be on fighting the oppressor, not fighting within what we've been fighting this whole time. And, um, uh, I do believe that this is going to be the generation to, you know, find that out and actually, you know, try to navigate this um, this fight a little bit better than we've done it in the past. Because it's like we need to get into these spaces to where we are eradicating what they what they've been allowing. And, right, um, right, right. Yeah, and you know, now I I so appreciate that. I really do feel like this is a moment, unlike any moment I've lived through. But I also want to give a warning, which of course everybody knows that because this is like any, like, unlike any moment I've ever lived through, um, we have different possibilities. And one of those possibilities is increased repression. And I'll just say it, fascism. Um, you know, we've, look at our history, fascism emerges. First of all, America has had a long history of fascism before it hit Europe. You know, that, that's what, you know, the slave regime, let's be honest, colonialism, is a form of fascism. That's where fascism gets its, its, its origins, its roots, its framework from colonial domination. So it's a long history. But right now, we've got to be really, really careful because I fear that, you know, we, it's not just because we have a fascist in the White House, you know, but it's because we have a fascist structure that, um, that in order to dismantle it, to overturn it, requires something greater than a whole bunch of liberals saying, you know, I want justice for George Floyd. It's going to require something deeper. So we've got to be prepared for that. Um, I agree. I agree. I agree. I think if we, like you've been saying, we reallocate those funds because they they have an overabundance in fund within the police department, and we start, uh, you know, inputting all those funds into impoverished uh, neighborhoods and neighborhoods that are, you know, uh, that succumb to. Um, the uh, over policing and stuff like that, mass incarceration and stuff like that. And we actually provide them with institutions and stuff. Well, not institutions, but um, organizations and tutors and stuff and put more, uh, like put, implement more things for progression in those neighborhoods and impoverished neighborhoods and to where the community doesn't suffer and it doesn't look like they should, you know, everybody deserves comfortable living. And, and that's a problem with uh, the, the people in Congress, the people in, uh, who have wealth right now, they're not thinking that way. They're not thinking everybody deserves a comfortable living. But if we give them that and we give them the opportunity to branch, uh, to pretty much, uh, you know, be a flower that grows because it's like, that's what everybody is in terms of opportunity. And they've never been given that chance, but we really do need to uh, give them that chance. I really appreciate everything that you uh, said, Dr. Kelly. Uh, and this time I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Muthasev. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. That was amazing and it's a very hard act to follow, so I will do my best. Um, 
and I could honestly just listen to you talk about those issues uh, for the whole duration. I guess I was uh, asked to, um, and let me show my screen. Uh, I was asked to uh, talk about the parallels with um, between the the Palestinian liberation movement and the Black liberation movement, uh, and that's what I'm going to focus on. And I'm very thankful that Dr. Kelly already discussed uh, police brutality, uh, focusing on the political economy of production of a lot of what we have now. Um, that should be very helpful for me. I'm trying to minimize this. Uh, sorry. All right, so um, last week, actually on Friday, Angela Davis was interviewed on Democracy Now! about the intersectionality of justice, focusing on what she termed as abolitionist feminism, which she, of course, many of us know that she has been calling for for a long, long time. In her talk, she addressed the never flinching support of Palestinian human rights as, as embedded actually in her own struggle. Even when the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute rescinded her award because of her support of the Palestinian BDS movement, which stands for Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, which is a, a, a global movement uh, for uh, human rights for Palestinians uh, and to sanction and boycott uh, Israel to put pressure on them to end uh, the Israeli colonization of Palestine. She emphasized that when she was in jail, in the 60s, and she was at that time facing um, potentially uh, life I mean, uh, death penalty at one point. Solidarity coming from Palestine was an important and crucial source of courage for her. Uh, so I wanted to start by stating uh, that and also saying that my title, When I See Them, I See Us, is actually the title of a video that um, was put together by um, uh, solidarity activists, both black and Palestinian, including actually Dr. Kelly was in that video. You can, you can Google it and find it. Um, Angela Davis was in it, um, um, Alice Walker, uh, Mark Lamontel, and others actually. Uh, and it, was, it came after Ferguson because Ferguson was really the catalyst that highlighted um, that kind of suffering. But as I said, this is an old going, you know, solidarity and, and, and kind of like looking at yourself in the mirror uh, type of, uh, of um, joint uh, work for liberation between Blacks and Palestinians. And so Ferguson actually led to more solidifying of, of, of uh, that relationship between Palestinians and the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, so in 2016, the Movement for Black Lives, which is a little bit different, it's a coalition of more than 60 organizations published its manifesto, uh, which was a comprehensive program of action, which consists of six demands, and they are on the screen, yes, but I know I'm going to run out of time, so I have to uh, be uh, quicker. You can actually check it online. Uh, but they had demands, you know, against, of course, uh, militarization of the police, uh, reforming the prison system, etc., and redirecting resources uh, for restorative justice. It had about 40 separate uh, proposals and 34 policy briefs. But one thing that generated a lot of, um, of um, you know, controversy at that time and attacks actually on the movement uh, was their stance on Palestine because the manifesto calls Israel an apartheid state and it characterizes the ongoing war in Gaza and the West Bank and all the practices by the Israeli military and colonization of Palestine um, as genocide, as continuous genocide. And, and they received a lot of, a lot of backlash for that. Uh, and actually, I'm happy that Dr. Uh, uh, Kelly mentioned the, also the, the fact that in the United States, we are a settler colonial state. And that's exactly the same thing that applies to uh, the creation of the state of Israel as a settler colonial state on the lands of indigenous Palestinians. So it's only normal that we have uh, those types of, of uh, parallel uh, you know, systems of oppression. So with the brutal murder of George Floyd that was captured on camera, and God only knows how many we don't have on cameras, um, that actually spared a lot of Palestinians to think back again and highlight the uh, joint struggle you know, for liberation between Palestinians and Blacks. There were murals, 
there were uh, poetry, um, you know, statements, demonstrations, mass demonstrations in Palestine, inside and outside of uh, the West Bank and, and, and Palestine 1948, etc. And this is just one example. However, I think one of the most prominent moments in, 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 uh, in the middle, actually, of, of uh, what I call now the Black Uprising or Intifada was the killing of Iyad al-Halaq. Iyad al-Halaq, you see his, his picture on the left, was a 32-year-old autistic man uh, who was shot to death on a roofless garbage room in Jerusalem, in, in, in the old city of Jerusalem. According to the testimony of his caregiver, who was by his side and tried to protect him, he was executed. For long minutes, he stood next, she stood next to him and pleaded for his life, trying to explain to the Israeli police officers in Hebrew and Arabic that he suffered from a disability. They shot him three times from close range with a rifle directly into the center of his body as he lay on his back, wounded and terrified on the floor of the room. And then let him, he, they let him bleed to death in spite of her pleas. Uh, as you can see, this is the apartheid wall that was um, built by Israel and on the right, you see uh, Yad al-Halaq, and, and not only Floyd, Yad al-Halaq too, and, and on the bottom, actually, on the same apartheid wall, you see uh, George Floyd erected alongside, you know, Palestinian martyrs and, um, and prisoners. And that really spurred Palestinians to stood, you know, in support of, um, of you know, uh, their black sisters and brothers, but all, not only in Palestine, but really all over the world. That involved another incident, actually, that people don't talk much about it, but Palestinians were actually going back and thinking about it, which is that the, the shooting, not thank, good for, thank God that it wasn't killing, but the uh, shooting of uh, Charles, um, sorry, uh, Charles Kinsey, who actually was a caregiver with a aut severely autistic man that the police was trying to shoot, and he was pleading with them. He even you know, laid on the, as you see the picture on the ground with his arms up and they still shot him in his leg for whatever reason they had in mind. Now it's needless to say that in 2016, the police officer who shot him was actually charged with only a misdemeanor. Um, another invocation and parallel that, you know, a lot of activists around the world, and, and that's my specialty is, you know, um, cyber activism or social movements online was the mother of Iyad al-Halaq. And, and, and the reason why she got a lot of attention, her sad story, how they killed her baby who actually she shaved and she gave, you know, she helped him get dressed the day of in the morning uh, because the last words by Floyd were mama, mama, he was pleading to his mom. And that was a call to all mothers actually around the world. And that really was very similar to what happened to the mother of Iyad al-Halaq. So um, the solidarity took a turn into focusing on the systems of oppression on brutality in both contexts. And you know, then people started thinking of the overall systems of oppression, not only in the case of Palestine and the United States, but all over the world. And I'm, I'm so grateful for Dr. Kelly for giving this amazing uh, introduction of the start of the police and the racist system here in the United States or the fascist system. And the problem is that system is not only in the United States, it's actually a global system of oppression. It functions, it's, it's in the business of man manufacturing wars, the wars that you, you don't see the American military, they rarely intervene in Europe, right? Most of the intervention, especially in the last 20, 30 or even more years, it has been actually in countries where brown and black people actually mainly reside. In particular, of course, the Middle East. And that's the problem. So we have a military that is so hungry and so uh, looking for money making, whatever it is. And now it turns into our own cities and neighborhoods and start actually recycling those attacks. And also um, the problem is this is how it works. So we have a war money machine that keeps on production of, of, uh, of arms and you know, military equipment and gear, et cetera. And they actually, our tax money, for example, some of the police department use our tax money to buy those equipments from Israel, which Israel actually buy originally from 
those weapon manufacturers or manufacture them themselves, but either you know from American weapon manufacturers or from their own um, factories, and they sell them back to those police departments. They train them, and uh, <laughs> and also they take four billion dollars in military aid every year from the United States government from our tax money that could have been used to do many, many wonderful things for our communities. So a lot of international solidarity. This was actually uh, done by a Palestinian artist. Her name is Lina. Um, and then those images surfaced after, after, you know, George Floyd, like you can find tens of those images and more of Palestinians, you know, facing very similar fates, sometimes deadly as George Floyd. You know, um, if you search for those, you find many of those images over and over. Um, and that was like one of the, um, you know, the cartoons that got a lot of attention worldwide. So the deadly exchange campaign and, and, and Professor Kelly is involved in that and he talked about it. It's, um, it's just briefly because I know I'm running out of time uh, and I can't see uh, if, if someone is writing me a note. So you better say it if you want me to stop. It's a coalition of different activist organizations and groups led by Jewish Voice for Peace started a few years ago especially after Ferguson and it slowly, you know, grew uh, a very serious conversation on that deadly exchange. The Alliance issued a report prepared by a research group called Researching the American-Israeli Alliance. Um, the 57-page report details U.S. law enforcement training at the hands of the Israeli military. It also discusses other related topics such as exchange of information, surveillance on Americans, and of course, you know, Palestinian citizens and use of force. And if you see on the top of this page, uh, it says get the report. So if you go there, you will just simply be easily, you know, uh, register and get that report. Um, and that's actually a copy of it. Um, so I, I'm just gonna, this is gonna be my last point. I don't wanna take any more time, but in the case of Israel and, and the military training and exchange is with other countries like Brazil, for example, uh, other entities, other brutal regimes. But the most prominent one, especially that it is funded by our tax money, is that with Israel. In the case of Israel, it started after 9-11 as what we call, they called counter-terrorism exchange. The first delegation included chiefs and deputy chiefs of police departments in California, Texas, Maryland, Fl Florida, and New York, agents from the FBI, the CIA, and future officers of ICE at that time, because we didn't have ICE at that time and direct directors of security at the uh, MTA in New York, even like the Transportation uh, Authority. Participants were schooled in Israeli military approaches to intelligence gathering, border security, checkpoints, coordination with the media, you know, to put a, you know, a positive spin on that, and met with high-ranking officials in the Israeli police and military, the Shen Beit, which is the Israeli internal intelligence, and the Ministry of Defense. Since then, U.S. law enforcement exchange programs with Israel have become standard with hundreds of American law enforcement officials from across the country going to Israel for training and thousands more participating in security conferences and workshops with Israeli personnel in the United States. These exchange programs with Israel facilitates the sharing of practices and technologies between U.S. law enforcement uh, and Israeli military, police, and intelligence agencies. In still militarized logics of security into the civilian sphere, normalizing practices of mass surveillance, criminalization, and the violent repression of communities and movements the government defines as threatening, and deepen ties between U.S. and Israeli officials to shore up support for a shared security model that justifies flagrant human and civil rights violations, according um, to um, that report. And, and this is a great investigative a uh, podcast that was on NPR, I think last week, American Police. Uh, the podcast is uh, Throw Line. All right, so in our call to defunding the police, I just wanted to share a few images to remind us why it's a very important call. And it's just one step, um, you know, in, in really an abolitionist movement to change the whole, to, to, to abolish the whole racist policing system in, uh, in the United States, hopefully uh, one day and, 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 and exchange it with a restorative community-based social justice system. Um, these are images of how the police looks like nowadays. I don't know about you, but this looks like a war zone, not uh, communities in the United States. 
um, and an example of the political, and those are in, in the 50s, not saying that they were not brutal, but definitely not as deadly. So um, just to go back and say that um, if, if imagine the New York police budget this year is $6 billion. Imagine if we use that back in our underserved communities, how wonderful that would be, how many programs we could have done to the community. Um, and lastly, it is doable. On June 9th, the Durban city in, in North Carolina banned training of police by Israeli military. This is just one example, one step in the right direction. And thank you so much. Apologies if I took all my time. Okay, so um, thank you so much, Dr. Muscaba, for your contributions. And I did um, want to thank you for touching on Ayad Halal, I believe is how you say his name. It's been a long held belief yeah, of mine. Right. Yes, Ayad yeah, Halal, thank you. Um, it's been a long held belief of mine that um, the police have not done enough ever to support or accommodate those who do require um, additional or specialized engagement. So um, thank you for contributing to this conversation. And thank you, Dr. Kelly, as well. I believe he has left. I wanted to introduce Daisy Ocampo from UCR. Um, after doing a bit of research myself on her, um, or I'm sorry, on Daisy Ocampo, I, I'm just happy that you are here to contribute. Daisy Ocampo is doing her doctoral research, which centers on relationships between ancestral memory and preservation of sacred landscapes in relation to and as part of indigenous communities and their responsibilities to this earth. And she emphasizes the colonial project in Mexico and the United States involved the targeting of sacred sites and that the manifestation of these policies have continued to exploit sacred and indigenous sites as well as indigenous people. Um, so if you would like to go ahead and... Okay, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Daisy Ocampo. Um, I am Kashkan or Kashamo uh, in my language. I am a new faculty member here at the History Department at Cal State uh, San Bernardino. And uh, my research specializations are in public history uh, as well as US history uh, and specifically Native American history. So I was asked uh, by Dr. Uh, Murray to present today on indigenous communities and policing. So I wanted to first start uh, by talking about uh, the history of policing when it comes up to native communities. Uh, so the way I like to approach um, policing within the context of Native Americans is by really uh, approaching and applying a settler colonial lens uh, to policing. And this really allows us to contextualize uh, policing as part of an ongoing system of oppression, of repression of Native people, Native cultures, and uh, native, uh, native lands. And so, you know, when we look at the beginning, this really started with early settlers uh, looking to uh, lay claims onto native and indigenous uh, land, right? And so when we look at these claims for land, it's really always tied to resources, as uh, Dr. Kelly mentioned. Um, and really, you know, using his words, it's, uh, it's really about gaining access to those lands to create private property, right? And this gets pretty much repackaged as white, private property, which we recognize today. And so, you know, in order to really lay claims to this land and its resources, it was so important for early uh, settlers uh, to be able to silence Native communities, right, in order to render them, um, you know, uh, not legitimate. So how did all this, um, you know, process take place? It happened through a lot of dehum uh, dehumanization uh, so if we look at, um, you know, these very toxic and pervasive characterizations of Native people as backwards, um, as inferior and the vanishing race, uh, looking at our cultural traditions as satanic, 
um, and also policing that. These are all the different ways that they were able to justify a colonial order here in the United States. And really this was the premise and the foundation of uh, needing a policing element here in the United States to sustain this colonial order. And it's not colonial as in the past, right? This has also been continuous and it's what we're experiencing today into our economic and political structures today. And so when I, you know, why does this matter? When I approach uh, policing, it's not just about law enforcement as Dr. Uh, Kelly mentioned, it, it's really not. It's about surveillance. Um, it is about policing being the coercive arm, right? That implements all these behaviors and secures uh, resources and property uh, for, you know, usually whites. Um, and, you know, it's important for us because it really alters our sense of self to avoid seeming threatening uh, or non-conforming, um, you know, in order to fit that order. So, um, you know, when, um, you know, and I think of the impacts that these are having in our interpersonal relationships, right? They are affecting the way we're raising our children. Uh, they are affecting our family dynamics. They are affecting how safe we feel if our siblings leave the home too late at night. You know, I know I have uh, three brothers and I think a couple of them are here today and how scary it is for them to leave after 9 p.m., right? And it's really the surveillance and how we've had to internalize it to then find safety. And that's why it doesn't work. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and um, share some examples of early uh, policing within Native communities. And like I said, um, really the first policing here of Native communities by whites was to police access to the land uh, by early pioneers. Um, so if we look at the gold rush, right, and this westward expansion, and they're moving west to find opportunities to find entrepreneurship projects and we're looking at the gold mines, you know, this set the stage for enslavement of Native people uh, for uh, murder campaigns and, you know, by who and Dr. You know, Kelly said it best, these were citizen militias and these were sanctioned by the state of California. So these were all through democratic means. Um, also, we're looking at the policing of religious traditions, right? Um, there it's, it, you know, especially when we look at uh, our dances and our sacred songs, these have always been framed as backwards, as satanic through this kind of uh, Christian uh, lens. Um, you know, if we look at the ghost dance, you know, and this was really a space where people were reclaiming their traditions, they were reclaiming their dances. And you would think, you know, what, you know, what's the harm in that? But actually, the, it was a very threatening time. The fact that Indian people got together, they were reclaiming their language, reclaiming their dances. And in that way, they were completely rejecting this colonial order that was being imposed onto them, right? Um, there was also the policing of productivity. I think when we look at Native uh, and Black communities, there's been this trope of uh, needing to be a productive member of society, right? So that you can't just be a human being. You have to generate something. You have to generate labor. You know, again, this is the premise for enslavement. Um, you know, and we look at, you know, who is doing this enforcement, you know, it was boarding schools, it was industrial schools, and these are all by the Bureau of Indian Education. This is all at the time the Department of the Interior, which is the federal uh, government. Um, you know, and so even just recently, if we look at forced relocation in the 1960s, you have a uh, tribal people, tribal members that are being removed from their reservations, uh, you know, rural reservations, and quite literally just dumped into cities, you know, uh, especially if we look at San Bernardino, there's a large population of Navajos, and why are they there? They're there because they were literally dropped off there from their reservations. 
completely lost and was told you need to get to work. You need to become a productive member of society. All the meanwhile, you know, reservation lands are shrinking, right? Because there's no longer claims. Um, and so to me, when I look at policing and indigenous communities, it's not just about what happened in the past, right? It's about why it happened and how it's shaping different realities for different people today. So when I look at Native American history and African American history, of course, they're their own fields of study. Uh, however, there are these shared histories, uh, parallel histories of being uh, severed from your land base, you know, and as indigenous communities, this is very important for us because if you're severed from your land base, right, uh, which, you know, is all encapsulated in our creation stories, in our dances, in our prayers, uh, then you really cease to exist as people, as human beings. You're no longer, uh, you know, the people of the mountain. For us, Kashkan, we're the people of the mountain. Why? Because in our creation stories, we were, we came from a mountain, you know? So suddenly, uh, in my research, our creation mountain is now uh, a tourist uh, designated site, you know? And so that disrupt that disruption, that, um, you know, that sacrilegious, you know, behavior on part of the state, it's so disruptive to our identities. And when we look at the enslavement of African Americans, it's, it's the same thing. There's this rupture from your land base. And I think there is a huge uh, rupture in your sense of belonging here in the United States. Um, and that, that also takes me, um, I remember last week I was also uh, watching, um, you know, the, the segments and the panelists and someone spoke about a quote by Audre Lorde uh, talking about proximity to death. Um, you know, and this is really important because this has shaped the reality of Black and Native folks here in the United States. There's this constant lurking of death. If it's not enslavement, it's forced relocation, it's murder, um, you know, it's scalping campaigns. So, you know, there is this sense that you always have to be on the lookout and be five steps ahead in order to make it, you know, and that just can't be. Um, so, and, you know, I really like to draw from, you know, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Reaper's Garden uh, by Vincent Brown, and he does an excellent job talking about death worlds, uh, death and agency in the transatlantic slave trade. And I really use that conceptual framework also within Native American history. Um, and so, you know, when we look at all of this, um, you know, today, with Black Lives Matter movement, you know, I can't help but think of, you know, recently in 2016, Standing Rock. And as Dr. Kelly said again, you know, it is about protecting corporate America. It's about protecting private interests. And it is this continuity that has always been there. It's these consistent threads. Um, you know, as we saw in Standing Rock at the face-off, right, it was tear gas, uh, it was excessive force during arrest, it was guard dogs being unleashed onto protectors, um, you know, and so in that way, what we're seeing is uh, this new generation that is committed to telling our own stories and really decentering these national celebratory narratives of the nation state. You know, that's one thing that I appreciate about this generation is, you know, people are ready to tell their own story. And that's why representation and all these uh, means and outlets are so important to be able to tell our own story with us being uh, at the center. And, um, you know, when we look at law enforcement, um, you're seeing a lot of the same issues so that you will see an under policing of cases, for example, of murder, uh, murdered and missing indigenous women, complete neglect, lack of resources, uh, the cases just skyrocket, right? And there's very little to be done. It's just part of Indian country. Um, and also when we look at the over policing of native men, it's those cases are the ones that usually lead to death at the hands of police brutality. 
And these 911 cases, right, they often begin with uh, calls about substance abuse uh, and mental health il illness. And so, you know, when we're really looking at historical trauma, you know, one, I uh, completely support, you know, the abolishing of law enforcement, you know, because it, you know, even with training, it, it's just not enough. It's not enough. And so with that, I just uh, wanted to wrap up and just talk about uh, a little bit about historical agency and how it informs our resiliency. You know, Native communities, uh, Black communities now have a new platform, which is social media. You know, and this has been really increasing connectivity. And I know a lot of different uh, online communities are using social media to tell their own stories through TikTok um you know and being able to pass the word that way um you know and i really like looking at performative histories um and these are not just uh you know histories that are fed from the archives but instead they are fed through performances and i mean performances as in traditional dances and how the and traditional songs right just there's a lot of different uh traditions depending on community and how they are reclaiming their history and their culture to inform the present, you know. So when we look at the Jingle Bell dancers, you know, at protests for George Floyd, this is all really about bringing that healing component from our cultures into our present to set our intentions and start discussions about, um, you know, having sovereign futures and self-determination and autonomous spaces. So. That is something that um, is very important to where we're at. And I'm happy to be here and uh, participate in this conversation about um, having sovereign futures and really creating uh, our own institutions and not just trying to recycle the old ones because as Dr. Kelly said, it doesn't work. So we really need to look at all our own communities, look at decolonizing them because you know, there's a lot of things that we've had to internalize over time and, you know, engage in this process of decolonization, what is important to us and what's going to carry us into the future. Thank, thank you. you thank you. Thank you, Dr. Acapo. Um, really, really powerful stuff. And I'm sure we'll have a chance to get right back at, um, right back to you in the um, Q&A segment of the sh today's show. And, in, and it's, um, in the honor of that, I just want to remind our attendees today, if you have any questions, please post them in our Q&A segment. We're going to have um, some time at the end of the show to um, go through your questions. That's another huge and important part of um, gathering here weekly is to be able to answer those questions or those cries from the community just to uh, give us all a sense of um, where do we go from here? So um, as we move on to our next panelist, I would like to introduce Mr. Troy Williams. Hey, how y'all doing today? Um, so my name is Troy Williams. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay, so my name is Troy Williams. I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of Wisconsin in the uh, Department of Civil Society and Community Research. So I study black spaces. Um, meaning that uh, different spaces where Black folks can come and come together in solace and in peace. And uh, I kind of, my the, the base of my research is uh, in um, Cheryl Harris's uh, work, uh, Whiteness is Property, and also Elijah Anderson's work is uh, in the iconic ghetto and white spaces. Now, what these two scholars uh, constantly speak about is the... Um, the the surveillance and the and the um and 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 how black people are uh, kind of kind of thought about when they enter into spaces that that they don't belong they are constantly surveilled they are constantly questioned they are constantly asked uh do they belong right so think of uh, george zimmerman when he saw trayvon martin walking down the street he said what are you doing here you do not belong and he questioned him and asked him to leave and proceeded to um take his life so in my in my work specifically i look at black opioid use here in Dane County in Wisconsin, where uh, the University of Wisconsin is, um, is based. So um, in Dane County, African-American opioid use is two times the rate of our white counterparts. 
And uh, what that means is that uh, black, so even though it's, uh, it, opioid use has been focused on and looked at as something that uh, this is a white rule issue, in Dane County, black people are overdosing at two times the rate. So I was a part of a team that went into the black community and met with community leaders about how, about how they can, um, about how, how and what they can do to make sure that they are in these safe spaces. So when we began to conduct our qualitative interviews, what we found out was that Black people um, thought that the systems that they were living in, the systems that were put into place to supposedly protect us, was actually causing more trauma, and what they titled systems-induced trauma. And uh, that entailed uh, at the school systems, right? So at the school system, students spoke about being uh, constantly arrested. So in middle schools, um, even though black, black people make up only 18% of the total population in Madison school districts, uh, in middle schools, uh, black women were making up 100% of arrests in schools. Uh, and when it came to child protective services, uh, we found that they were being, that children were being ripped away from their homes and placed in uh, foster care for reasons as, as frivolous as um, they did not, they did not have adequate um, enough uh, money to take care of their kids. Now, this was at the discretion of the social workers, right? So what I wanted to do, uh, what we wanted to do was just look how people are surveilling and how they're uh, deciding who is and who is not um, deviant, if you will, right? So next is the healthcare system. In our healthcare systems, we saw that um, when people went to the hospital and went to the doctor's office to deal with simple things as they had a broken leg or they were in pain, they were often being marked as drug seekers. And when they were being marked as these drug seekers, they could not have access to um, painkillers anymore. So we heard uh, stories of uh, people who had uh, major surgeries, such as like leg amputations in the hospital because they marked them as drug seekers, they could not get access to painkillers. So just very horrible stories about how these institutions and groups were constantly surveilling and policing the actions and the movements of Black people. Next, of course, is the criminal justice system. So we hear about judges and paroles and probation officers constantly um, policing and surveilling of the lives of Black people. So uh, these people constantly just spoke about how these institutions constantly work together to surveil, it, to surveil them, to watch over them. And what we wanted to do was to hear their story specifically about what could be done, what are they doing to protect their spaces. Um, and uh, we, and they, in, in these stories and in our interviews, they spoke about the importance of being able to gather and come together and, and, and exchange information networks and to create these types of resources so that they can uh, survive, right? So, and I want to be clear here, right? So even though these Black spaces are important, they are vital to the survival of these people, I am not at all trying to pitch that this is a solution to these issues. I am from Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta is a predominantly black community. And as we see right now in the world, what's happening in the world, that even though we do have these black spaces, black bodies are still constantly over surveilled and watched over. So that doesn't necessarily mean that because someone has access to a black space, that they are not police, right? So um, I just want to ensure that, you know, make sure that we're communicating that, you know, even though black spaces may not be a solution to these issues, um, my, my main thing of what I research is just exploring um, what black spaces are and how we can use that as a, as a sort of a um, protective factor over surveillance. And I'll yield my time. I thank you all for inviting me again, and I appreciate you. Appreciate that, uh, Mr. Williams. Uh, great, great spiel. Um, what I wanted to briefly talk about, uh, just uh, how you're still saying that we are going to be over surveilled in these uh, and just over police in, in the in our community still i was uh thinking about this it would be a great idea to fund something to where it's like our our black students who are well not just our black students our, our whole diverse population that are pretty much you know for progression for progression of change and for progression um you know within their own communities to you know fund something to where they go back to their communities and they could be the uh, you know those leaders for those um 
for those organizations and for those schools that don't particularly have you know people that actually want to see change that are you know constantly producing the same systemic you know behavior that has been producing you know hopefully if we get more people into those spaces then we'll be able to get those spaces to you know what we need them to be to actually um eradicate everything that they've got going on at, uh, and eradicate what they've been producing out of us and then we actually you know get what we've, we know we are and get what we know we can get out of all of our people and um you know out of those impoverished neighborhoods because you know everything that they're doing is systemic you know it, that's all it is but it's like if we teach them that you know that you don't have to succumb to the system anymore and you know uh they're not going to make it to where you you are to come into the system, then you know, maybe we can get out of this. But um I also like to take this time to uh thank you for your words again, uh Mr. Williams. I also like to take this time to uh introduce Mr. Roberto Rivera. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh thank you for that introduction. And I like to thank um everyone who has spoken so far. Uh, it's been quite enlightening. I've been taking notes down. Um, I'm a, a six-year graduate student at the University of California, Riverside. And uh, I wish to share with you my master thesis. And as I share with you my master thesis, um, I'm also going to share with you uh, within the thesis the uh, theories that I utilize to help explain what we currently see taking place here. Uh, with police violence and as it manifests itself in communities of color. I'm also a retired police officer of 20 years. I worked, I retired out in 2011. I had a injury to my hand. So uh, as part of my severance, I went to school at California State University, San Marcos. Um, what was enlightening to me there is where I first learned the concept of double consciousness by W.B. Du Bois with a professor by the name of Gary Rollison. And as I shared some of my experiences as a uh, retired police officer with some of my professors there, I quickly found that that university, Cal State San Marcos and their sociology department, really, um, it was a university where they had critical criminology. And I was able to take my life events, my lived events, uh, take a look at that and be able to write about it in a way that I could talk about how this violence manifests itself and and to try to make sense of it using the uh, using the uh, theories I'll be discussing in a few minutes. So that being said, I'm also uh, teach at University of uh, at UC Riverside. As I'm finishing up, um, I work either as a TA. I've had uh, an instructor position there as well for a, for a quarter. Uh, I always start out telling my students about the binary. Professor Kelly, uh, I believe he's left, but when he was here, he spoke about Jackie Robinson. And when I talk to my students and I ask them, who was the person that broke the colored barrier in baseball here in the United States, everyone's quick to raise their hand for those that know of Jackie Robinson and, and they mention him. What they have problem with is remembering the year or knowing what the year was, which is 1947. But in truth, before Jackie Robinson uh, played professional baseball, we had African-American baseball players, but they were light-skinned and they had privilege in the sense that they were allowed to play. Additionally, we also had Latino baseball players and Native American baseball players that were allowed to play because of their skin tone which brings on uh, an added dimension of my research. I recently uh, came back from the country of Jamaica. I won a Fulbright US Scholar Award in criminology. And when Professor Brooks, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Young had mentioned the uh, slave insurrection that had taken place, it brought to mind quickly my knowledge and the history of Jamaica in which the Maroons, and the character of Nanny, which fictional or not, was someone who challenged uh, this uh, colonial order that Professor Ocampo had mentioned earlier. So as I'm about to share with you my, uh, my scholarship, uh, I want you to keep in mind that why my, I'm not focusing on the binary, but I do discuss it. And these parallel histories that we have 
in office involved shootings and police violence also takes place in Latino communities. The only difference is that you don't hear about them. If I ask everyone in this room, and I believe we have 101 attendees right now, if you can name an African American who's been shot and killed at the hands of a police officer, I'm willing to bet every one of us can think not just of one or two, but more than quite a few. But if I ask everyone that's on this Zoom webinar right now, how many Native Americans or Asians or Latinos can you name that's been involved in an officer ball shooting? I'm willing to bet, based on my experience, that there'll just be a few of you. So my master thesis focuses on uh, a case study that I wrote uh, three years ago, and it's on uh, three independent, unrelated, officer involved shootings that took place in a Southern, uh, Southern California community within five days. The commonality between these three shootings were that of the five officers involved, five, all five of them were white males, um, and they also had a military background. The commonality with these three, uh, with the three deceased was that they were Latino males with limited English speaking ability. So when I wrote this uh, case study up, I also wrote about a police initiative that took place within that community. It was called the Adelante Project. It was a 10 point plan that was addressed to not just calm, calm the uh, protests that were taking place, but to bring back the trust that was lost in the community. Similar to what you saw in Ferguson, similar to what you recently saw in Minnesota and most recent here in Atlanta. But as it was mentioned earlier, these are, these are events that have been profiled primarily uh, because, of, uh, because of cameras, phone cameras. These events have been taking place for thousands of years. This stain, this historical narrative that we have started really with the 20 and out um, on, that came here and the first black slaves that we had in the United States. And then this narrative was carried out with slavery as well as the uh, genocide of Native American, Americans that we saw here in the US. So as I look at my, my research on these three um, uh, unrelated officer boss shootings, I'm grounded in three theories, which I'll go over in a second. This initiative that I spoke of earlier um, that, I, that, that was written uh, addressed this trust and the trust was regained. In fact, it not only was it regained in this community, the violent crime um, index went down by almost 21%, which is of historical significance. The outcome of this was that uh, the officers that were involved in this project were allowed to present nationally at the Department of Justice Annual Conference in Detroit that year. And then also a second outcome, uh, well, I would say more, it was a finding in how police departments get funded. In other words, what had happened here is that the officers that were involved were, they weren't demoted, but they were removed from this particular unit that addressed the three officer involved shootings. And the reason for that, which was later found out, is the way funding happens here in the United States. When you have a high crime rate, there's additional funding into those cities. So if you try to, let's uh, examine this maybe from a micro level, let's say Los Angeles, and you might look at Rampart or 77th Division. These are areas with higher crime rates, so more, more funding gets generated into these areas. Now, even when you have an initiative that brought down violent crime by 21%, we were broken up. That unit was broken up. I was the officer that was part of that initiative, that wrote that initiative. And this case study uh, approach that I utilized in my master thesis was from an insider perspective. Um, so when I talk about this, I talk about this um, knowing who the actors were and, 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 and the events as they occurred. The theories that I utilized in my research on this case study, the first one is critical race theory. And I look at critical race theory because as a, as a, uh, as a very junior scholar compared to, to everyone here on this panel, um, I utilize that in the understanding of how race is constructed. And I look at it through a social legal lens. In other words, I don't just take 
precedences that we've had, legal cases, such as um, what our founding fathers did with our U.S. Constitution and three-fifths of a human being for those who are African-American. I continue along that line and I look at the uh, Naturalization Act. I look at uh, the 1882 uh, uh, Act of uh, the Chinese Exclusionary Act. And then I continue into 1896 with the Plessy versus Ferguson Act, which is a catalyst and the start for Jim Crow and the uh, uh, coast of the South here in the United States. And then I continue to move up that line and I look at the 1954 case of Brown versus the Board of Education, which leads to my second theory. The second theory that I utilize in my work is interest convergence theory. This is Derek Bell's work in which he's trying to understand um, how these legal presents are, are taking shape here in the United States and how is it that we have this racial divide. So what Professor Derek Bell came up with is that through this theory is that in order to have change, by those who are white, they have to agree and allow for that change to occur. That was a case in my case study in how this temporary as, as it may be, uh, was allowed to occur. And the third area of research that I utilize is black feminism. Um, if somebody would have told me 10 years ago, I would be using black feminize, feminism to describe uh, police violence, I would have said no. Uh, but in how I use it today in, that, in, the, uh, in my uh, master thesis is that when you look at black feminism and you look at the area of, known as intersectionality, intersectionality is the discourse that African-American women have. If you can imagine an intersection of discourse where you have gender as well as race, I'm expanding on that concept to include language barrier and citizenship which uh, if it comes up the course of discussion, we can discuss that further. So these are areas of research I'm quite interested in. Uh, when when uh, there's been other events that we have had in the course of our history here that uh, may, I might be able to bring up, but I, do, I am grounded in our history here in the US with my, with my research. And I'm looking forward to uh, more of this conversation. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You're muted, Yvette. Can you hear me? Sorry, my my sound was not doing well. Okay, so there was a question. Thank you also as well um, for your contributions, um, Mr. Rivera. We appreciate you coming in and speaking with us. And we're gonna go ahead and go to questions. And one of the questions was, what do you think of school policing, um, even as far as K through 12? If and I wanted to actually direct that question to uh, Mr. Troy Williams, since you were speaking on black spaces and safety in those areas. Could you repeat the question? You said when we're thinking about policing, what I didn't hear the end of it, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, could you repeat yourself? I didn't hear the end of your question. It said uh, when you're thinking of black uh, or abolition or K through 12. Um, um, we want to direct this question towards you about what you think about school policing on campus, not just in college, but as well as K through 12 school, because you did speak on black spaces and safety in those spaces. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, my personal opinion is that uh, police do not belong in schools. Um, I attend, uh, I grew up in a school in uh, College Park, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta. And uh, there were times where we would have an excess of 16 safety officers um but we didn't have we we didn't have certain books in classes we had to leave the books in schools right so um i believe that those there if this is supposed to be a safe space for uh students then the police should not be there as dr kelly was stating earlier um 
the 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 officers being there uh the the idea of police officers were created out of trauma and how can i exist in a space where uh police are so i do not believe that uh, police officers do not belong in any schools can i can i touch on that right. i would like to yes yes go ahead go ahead yeah i'd like to add to that and i agree with troy with troy saying uh, some of the best scholarship that we've had here in the United States in my field in sociology has not been by sociologists. It's been those with attorney backgrounds, as Michelle Alexander. As you examine these children, K through 12, they become part of the school to prison pipeline. In other words, the commodity that we have for these, uh, for high incarceration are become these children. Oakland, California, uh, about 10 years ago, started a practice of restorative justice. It became quite successful. It was started by, uh, ironically, I saw the uh, picture of Evangela Davis. It was started by her sister up in Oakland, and it became a, it be, it's becoming a model in the US. But as you look at, at mass incarceration here in the United States of people of color and the overrepresentation of, of black and brown bodies in prison, um, this is part of the reason why for it. I also wanted to add about the element of documentation. Uh, once you have law enforcement in schools, you begin your rap sheet. And that's just, you know, what happened. So that if you're tardy, um, you know, that gets documented. Now you're suspended, right? Uh, now you have interventions by uh, law enforcement. Uh, your parents have to go to court now, right? Uh, why, you know, why is your child late? And so what, what starts to happen is uh, this process of documenting behavior. And, you know, when you look at the household and let's say there's a dysfunctional household or whatnot, and you fast forward to 12th grade, I mean, there are students that are going to have pages on pages of documented incidents. And how is this student ever going to aspire to go to higher education to start your own business and to envision something for themselves um you know that goes behind what's you know their student file already so you know i don't think they belong in the um in the school system especially k through 12. thank you thank you both for um adding into that and i really appreciate you both touching a bit on the prison to or the school to prison pipeline that a lot of children of color experience. Um, thank you for, for adding to this discussion. Thank you as well, guys. Uh, we did have a question coming in from um, one of our attendees, um, Eubin. Um, he said he would love to know how students in universities can push the abolishment agenda when it comes to um, the abolishment of um, campus police and, um, and et cetera. Anyone can answer the question. I just want to, before we answer, uh, I want to ask Dr. Texiera to, isn't this also the topic of next week's uh, panel? Yes, it is. Yes. Oh, thank you. So just, yeah, so thank just you for that my... free plug, Alam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we're going to have two, uh, the president of the San Bernardino Schools um, Unified School District, uh, the board, and also a sociology professor, Dr. Elsa Valdez, who's, who's in our department here on campus. And she was a former school board member uh, for I think about 12 years. So she has some thoughts and some insight, they both do, uh, in regard to campus policing. Uh, and we'll also have two, uh, two people from the West Side Action Group, uh, a very, very active, uh, entity in San Bernardino uh, who will be joining us on the on the panel. Can I just make one point though about the school police um, and and the question is how do we do this whether it's K through 12 or college I think organize 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 you know that's what Frederick Douglass said that's what Angela Davis said, you know, you can't do anything all by yourself. You've got to organize. If you, if you find three or four people who are 
as passionate as you are about something, then, then get together with them and organize. And I would just call your attention to the six-year-old girl who, was, who had a temper tantrum at school. Uh, Roberto, you may have heard about this. And she had a temper tantrum at school. They called the campus police or the, you know, the school police. He put her in handcuffs. And this child was begging, pleading, crying. And I just, I, 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 the good news is the officer was fired. Um, but people even in the office were crying because they did not, they just wanted him to scare her and he wound up taking her away in handcuffs. And this is where we have become when it comes to policing our children. There is such a thing as the school to prison pipeline. Schools look like prisons now. They don't look like schools. And there's metal detectors, there are people walking around with guns and, uh, and flak vests. And, and what, kind of, what kind of atmosphere is that for our, our children? How can you learn in that kind of atmosphere? And it just so happens that schools are the safest places in communities. They are the safest places and campus police do not make them safer. There are all those school shootings that they, they had campus police who could not have stopped those school shootings. So they're ineffective, in other words. Thank you. I, I, I totally agree with Dr. Texera, and I would like to add that um, students actually have an obligation, moral obligation, to start this process. It's not a choice, it's a must. Um, to be active agents of change, you can't be bystanders anymore, right? Um, and unfortunately, I don't know how many of you remember a very painful um, incident uh, or actually murder that happened on our campus by our campus police in, I think, 2012. Uh, 2013. Williams, or 13, yes, who was a black man with um, bipolar depression. Mm -hmm. And I think he was off med his medication in the dorms, so he had an episode of being rated, etc. So the police was called to come and help him. They ended up killing him. So that's not another example of sometimes the police is not even trained, you know, to, to handle those situations. I, I probably have a little bit more empathy when I talked about Iyad al halaq or, uh, you know, um, uh, the caregiver, uh, Charles uh, Kensey, um, dealing with special needs, you know, people, mm -hmm. etc. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know how to express this, but you, they are not helpful, they are lethal. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of dealing with a situation where they de-escalate and they calm him down, take him to a hospital or take him, you know, to get the care he needed, you know, the family is just shocked to learn that their son was killed in the dorms at CSUSP. So, I, I think I'm, I sub, totally support actually um, severing connections with the police, uh, especially on campus and in particular actually in schools. I don't want police to be uh, on, in my son's, his 10 years old uh, school. Absolutely not, you know, there's no need at all. Could I, could I jump in and say one more thing? Uh, and here in Madison, there's an organization, well, there's a couple of organizations uh, called Freedom Inc. and Urban Triage. And what they do, they strategize specifically about what they can do to get um, police out of school. So they create infographics, they attend uh, school board meetings, uh, they create um, all of these large campaigns that focus specifically on what is needed, how much the, uh, how much the school board is putting into police and they're saying how they would like to see these funds reallocated. They even do a, a postcard campaign where they send postcards to the uh, school board, um, to the school board members' homes to say that please defund police and they give specific reasons. And uh, just to piggyback on what was said earlier, it is extremely important to be tactful and um, in, 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 your, in your attack against uh, removing police and, and this abolitionist mindset. Why? Why? Yeah. Can you, can you tell like to, us why? Yeah, absolutely. Why is, it, why is it important to be careful? 
And uh, I'm not trying to be argumentative. I just need you to uh, expound on that. Well, I, I didn't, I, if I said careful, I didn't mean that. I meant tactful, being tactful in your, in, your, in your attack towards these, removing these entities away from, uh, away from these schools. Not careful. I mean, careful, <laughs> careful is not what we need in this. We need to, we need to be intentional about, these, okay. about this movement. Does anyone know about the, the case of Camden, New Jersey? I know, I know that someone has read about this. They disbanded their police department. Yeah. And they started off at the ground level building up and, and uh, hiring uh, safety officers who are, um, who, who are community folks, uh, not necessarily living in the community, but who like the community. You know, if white people had... Uh, 200 black men coming into their neighborhoods every single day with guns, there would be outrages. There would be marching on Washington. There would be all kinds of defunding and, and everything else. Yet we as people of color are so, we're, we're, we're just so used to being treated so harshly and 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 the, the people who are supposed to serve us don't like us they and how do you you know i always tell my my uh, my future teachers you can't teach somebody that you don't love and i don't mean you know love like i want to take you home and you can be my child but you can you you have to somehow have a certain my uh, kind of respect for the people that you're serving and the police are just one part of that, of that um, process. There's teachers, there's social workers, there are all these folks who are coming into black and brown neighborhoods and they don't like us. I mean, it's just, it's just as simple as that. Can I add, just one second, just to the example, because you mentioned the uh, Camden, New Jersey example. There's another example that just happened past week in terms of the schools. The Denver School Board actually just both last week voted to yep. phase out police of the district. So, you know, mm -hmm. phasing out slowly until mm -hmm. it doesn't exist. So it's, sure. people are doing it. It's not like and some- The models are out there. Yeah. The models are out there. Yeah, I, I like to address the, the, the part question and the comment that Ms. Tixar is mentioning. You know, um, when we spoke earlier, or it was mentioned about the, uh, the uh, slave insurrections and uh, how black slaves were utilized to police and bring back these runaway slaves. For me, um, as a critical race theory, I look at that and I look at to what we currently see right now, where you have higher rates of patrol officers, people of color in these areas patrolling. The reality, I hate to say it, is that you'll have more officers of color working in universities than you do those that have tenure track positions. Mm -hmm. If you look at professors, and you look how whiteness is constructed, and you look how it, uh, where it reaches out, and not just in, in sociology, but in just most departments, you see a lack of critical scholarship. Well, if you have a lack of people of color in tenure track positions, it never comes out. To have Professor Ocampa at your university, she's able to speak of the marginalization of Native American people. But the reality is when you look at the numbers of Native American professors, in not just the CSU system, but the UC system, there's a huge underrepresentation that takes place. Daisy, can I ask you a question? Sorry, uh, Professor Ocampo. Um, can you talk about native police? Because we tend to believe that if, if the, the police look like the community, that, that everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. But I, my sense is that it's not. And you're talking about tribal police. Senior. Tribal police, correct. correct. Yeah, so, um, you know, part of, um, you know, um, tribal sovereignty is, you know, uh, capacity to have your own law enforcement system. And I, I will say, I think with uh, tribal policing there, you know, the, when you look at community, that is a very defined um, who you're serving and, uh, you know, public safety uh, of the who is very concise and it's often relatives and aunties and elders. 
And so you do have a lot more respect for, you know, um, historical trauma. Uh, if someone is found, uh, let's say, drunk on the side of the road or whatnot, you know, you're, you're not going to put them down the path, right? Maybe you put them in the back seat and take them home. So, you know, you, you do have this empathy for historical trauma. Uh, you do have an acknowledgement of uh, cultural institutions, uh, such as like sacred sites, you know, if there's going to be a, a funeral wake uh, and what that involves in that circumstance and safety. Um, and so I, I think it, it, it can uh, look uh, different, but I, I know that with the case with tribal policing, there's a complete disempowerment when it comes up to prosecution of non-tribal members, right? So you have issues of jurisdiction where, um, you know, there, let's say there's, you know, Morongo uh, Police, uh, you know, Department, and then you have Riverside Police Department, you know, and you're trying to prosecute someone that's not from the Morongo Reservation. Um, yeah, they're completely, you know, they're not empowered to make those calls in terms of prosecuting non-tribal members. And this has really been at the heart of really these issues of murdered and missing Indigenous women. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I appreciate everybody that has spoke. It was really just an overabundance of uh, information. Um, one question that I actually... Uh, saw it was from, let me find it, uh, from a Mr. Edward McIver. I hope I didn't, I hope I said your name right. Um, but I think it pretty much ties into everything that we're talking about. It says, what things are being done to make Black agency more common in places of leadership? Because when I see our community leaders, our community uh, leaders where these things are happening, all I see is people saying, oops, well, it is what it is. We're going to do the bare minimum. When I see these Boras and city councils, there uh, may be one person of color, if that, and I'm willing to gather that most of those people have not, would not set foot in the community that are being f affected by police calling. Um, it, is, it is what it is, murders. Um, I would also ask, what can we do now while the iron is hot saying Black Lives Matter is the start, but the blood dries and the fire cools? What things do we need to do now to make permanent change? And that's one thing that's going on right now. We're having a great conversation. We're coming up with all these different things. We're seeing, you know, formulas and different tactics that are being taken place, all, you know, all over the nation, all over the world, in terms of how to abolish the police and to implement uh, things for actual change. But it's like, it, it comes to a time where it's like, when are we going to, you know, nullify the conversation and actually get into the action? And what are the you know steps that we actually need to make sure that these actions are taking place? Because it's like we're getting to to the point where our conversation is getting to the front door, you know, of the Supreme Court and everything. Like we've asked for you know police immunity to uh, like it it to be you know looked at, and um and they you know they they said no, they said that they wouldn't do that, like they wouldn't offer that to, and that you know Trump pretty much appoints all those people, so it's like we're against our own law right now, even to the point where it's like, they just basically said that they're going to allow them to keep doing us how they're doing, how they've been doing us in the street. So it's like, we need to implement things. We need to eradicate the people who don't want change and the people that have upheld the system for so long. We need to start getting to a point where we, the people are actually speaking mm -hmm. and we, the people are actually making the changes that we actually want implemented because they're, they're not doing it. And voting isn't doing it because they get into their they get into office and they still do exactly what the system is you know upholding for so long. So, but anybody can answer that question. Uh, I know we haven't got. A little and bit Jeremy, time. Jeremy made a, a great point in the chat as well. It's time for our, our our next graduates, our next leaders, future leaders, to step up to that plate and run for these offices. You don't have to have a special training to to run for office. You just have to have the heart and the mind to do so. Um, I recently ran for office early 2020 uh, for City Council of San Bernardino, and I'm a student. Mm. I'm a senior at Cal State San Bernardino. And um, so that's, that's proof there that if your heart is in the community and you want change, you go out there and you seek that change and, and you put your, your heart on the line for the community. And that's what it's gonna take for our, our newly grads to get out there and crest in that degree and really show the world what we need really get out there and speak for the people 
it's going to take a lot to get us back on what it means to represent this nation and that's for our people and not for politics so um you know a lot of people get in those seats and they do take advantage of what those seats mean but we have a a, a generation of students that's about to graduate and it's, it's their turn next to do so and I, I would also add to that and that was really um for both of you guys that you got, you all are you know, as someone has already said today, you know, we're passing the baton to you. Um, but one crucial um, office in every city and county is district attorney. There is a district, district attorney in Los Angeles by the name of Jackie Lacey, who, um, who is a huge disappointment to the community. She has never prosecuted one police officer for brutality not one and she she ran on a campaign of progressivism right and she's not uh, on the other hand uh, there's a new district attorney in san francisco who seems to be on the right track in terms of he i mean he immediately fired i don't know how many prosecutors because they were you know lock them up and throw throw away the key so but whatever whatever just campaign you think is worthwhile, get on that campaign. You know, I've walked the streets, knocked on doors to uh, get people to vote for my particular candidate. And it's something when people see you face to face and you make sense to them, then, you know, it's, uh, you've got a, you've got a vote. Uh, you've got a vote. So um, I would not discount voting. I would not because uh, these folks are in there they are bound and determined to put as many people in prisons uh, as possible for petty drug offenses. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, I don't think that's going to be tolerated anymore. I don't, I don't nullify, I, I agree with you completely. I don't nullify voting at all. You know, uh, okay. we fought for it for so long. It's, yes. it's, 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 we should do it. But my whole thing is the fact that they're being appointed and they're still upholding what's been upheld for so Get long. Get them out. Get them out. Next time, get them out. It, yeah, and, and I agree with you, but I would add to that, you need to let, take a look at the position of your city manager. Your city manager influences the type of police officer and the running of that particular city. You have to understand when it comes to policing, the, the current model that's in place and it's been placed under Bracken with, uh, with NYPD and for community policing is a broken windows theory. In other words, when you have a community in a house with the window that is broken, the elements of crime are more likely to come in. In other words, you might have someone come in, burglarize the house. Now you have drug activity taking place and becomes an eyesore to that community. That is the current model of policing. Now I'm currently developing my methods of policing that uh, I'm hoping uh, will be in book form in, uh, in the fall. But one of the areas I touch on is broken windows theory. And when you examine it, as a sociologist is I'm not concerned with the window that becomes broken. I'm more concerned is in how that house became empty in the first place. And when you address that issue, the broken window becomes irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Good point. I think, I think most criminologists know that, that broken windows just did not work. It just put a lot of people in jail. They still teach it. They still yeah, teach it in I universities, know. Know. sadly enough, which is another conversation for another day. Um, I wanted to um, add, a, and I know uh, within tribal communities being so um, tight knit and and small, um, but I think there are a lot of uh, different tribal uh, pedagogies that you know hopefully can spark things in different directions. So I know in my community, we're Kashtan. Uh, our tribes is located in Zacatecas in the desert in, in Mexico, and uh, we don't have law enforcement. Uh, we don't have homelessness. I, I, I remember running around at midnight and absolutely not being a big deal. Someone can always say where they last saw me, right? And, oh, well, she's at this house, you know, go, go get her there. Um, but that doesn't mean we didn't have these cultural institutions that were regulating us. So that, for example, if there was stealing, um, 
or if there was, for example, domestic violence, there is a council of elders. We also have our council for our, our sacred dance, our suchi. And, you know, if you aren't on good terms, you can't dance. Um, you know, if you don't know how to behave within the community, well, guess what? You're kicked out of the community and we're so small. However, that, that's all you know. So to be kicked out is a very huge deal, you know? Same thing, DUI. So, um, you know, I remember the last time, you know, if someone was stealing, there is actually a space, a central space in our community where they have to sit in the middle and they're tied and they're shamed. They're shamed by the community and then they go back home, you know, because that there's that accountability. Um, and I saw in the Q&A, there was a, a question about the public monuments that are going up. I think this is very important. I spoke a little bit in my presentation about this generation uh, really committing to rewriting history. And I think all these monuments coming down are part of that. So I think, you know, as um, Native communities here, they've been long arguing for all these statues of Father Sarah to go down, of all these slave owners to go down, really rewriting the mission system from a Native perspective. And so I think in a way there's, there's now this community accountability to rewrite history in a way that honors community histories. And again, not these national celebratory, uh, celebratory um, you know, uh, personalities that we see throughout our parks in DC. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that really quick. That is a great point. And I, growing up as a, as a Catholic here in California, um, and even uh, uh, in, the, in the public schools, seeing how in second grade, it's part of your assignment to reconstruct a mission. Um, and that's in, in, in Catholic schools to see that and to get, have that reproduce itself over and over again generationally. Um, I also want to add that I would go uh, beyond that and look in, in people that we celebrate. Um, Christopher Columbus in the, in the Caribbean murdered the, the native indigenous Taino Indians. And not only was he part of a genocide, uh, there was also the raping of women as well. When you look at the name Colon, C-O-L-O-N, uh, that is Columbus in Spanish. When you look in the island of Puerto Rico, uh, that's probably about 15% of the entire island has that last name. They said that he fathered over 100 children on the island. So uh, I wanted to address that. I would say that as well. Thank you all. Thank you all for your incredible remarks today. Um, and as we close out today's conversation on race and policing, I would just like to take this time to just thank you all uh, for being a part of this monumental moment um, in today's world, in today's society, in today's climate. Um, I, I definitely can't close out without thanking you guys tremendously for your efforts and for your, for your time just being here today and um, being able to ease the community as well and get uh, questions answered um, as, we, as we take steps to to what, what's next for the world and what's next for us all um, in these moments. Um, it's very important to be intentional um, in what we do next, um, be strategic, be mindful. And um, again, we will weather the storm together. So um, again, special thanks to my um, co-hosts, Cameron Payant and Yvette for being here. If you guys can just sign us off. Um. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate the, just the depth that each of you went into. Every point covered anything that could have raised a question that could have been questioned. Thank you for covering it. Thank you for just being inclusive in your statements, always inclusive of all the communities that are being oppressed in your statements. Thank you. I agree. Um, thank you guys for all your time. Uh, all the different questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to them. Uh, hope you guys join us for, you know, more discussions. Uh, also, I really do want to stress the fact that I do hope that this isn't just, you know, us conversing and that's all it's going to be and that it will just be uh, just a continued conversation. The, the things that we are talking about implementing, these are the things that we actually need to be trying to get implemented. If we do believe that they'll, um, 
create the changes that we need to be, you know, we need to see within our community and within our world. So um, I appreciate everybody within the, uh, the Zoom today. All right, so tune in next week, guys, to the conversations on race and policing. We have special guests from our West Side Action Group here in San Bernardino. Uh, we also uh, will be talking about um, steps in moving forward and how to uh, begin the steps of um, students um, abolishing um, policing on their campuses. So thank you all for being here. Have a great night. Thank you. Good job. Good job, everybody. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you all for being here.